and uh, that's my affiliation, and this is the conference we're at. And, um, okay, took care of that. Russell, you might want to talk from the other side. So right, I've heard that, there. I've heard that because from... Because you get in the way of the projection. No, no, I, I've heard that from several people, and I myself gave the advice yesterday to someone, so um, everything's going wrong today. My, uh, just one second. I guess they want me to... Sorry about that. Uh, very big field. There is higher level, which deals with organization and other things. And there's lower level, which deals with things like punctuation. You can spend the whole semester in, in college, in high school, just talking about punctuation mechanics. You can spend the whole uh, semester dealing with organization. My focus will be on higher level. And the point is writing is complex, multidimensional, organizational. So, uh, I, there were many citations. I just took this one. Good writers appear to have more flexible, high-level planning and more self-conscious control of their planning than poor writers. And the question is, how do you give this to various people? How do you impart it? It's very easy to teach punctuation, where to put commas, and how to make uh, sentences active than passive. How do you teach that? And that will be the focus of my talk today. First of all, who is this relevant to? And in looking at the literature, you find that it's relevant to a lot of people. First of all, it's obviously relevant to uh, K through 12 education. It's relevant to college and university education, but there's also a lot of literature on training adults seeking jobs. And as you take a person in midlife, they've had their education, they haven't had their education, and they want a course so they can write better because that helps them when they get jobs. And there are techniques for doing this and a lot of the techniques focus on the things I'm mentioning. Then there are people with disabilities. Uh, if a person is disabled, if he has HDDD, or she has HDDD, or a few other things like this, it's not that difficult to teach them lower level things like punctuation and um, various other types of things, but can you teach them organization? So there's, there is literature on teaching disabled people and what works with them. And there's a rich literature on the, on the above, what works and what doesn't work. OK. So I thought I'd mention, before I dive into what I'm doing, some of the various things. All of them have these cool uh, monomics COPS, which stands for Capitalize, Organize, Punctuate, and Sense. And that addresses a lot of lower level things. Tree um, does deal with higher level. So you start with a topic sentence. That's what the T stands for. And then you go to R, which stands for reasons. What are your reasons for liking that topic sentence? Why are you supporting it? Then you give the explanations, and then you give an ending. So that's sort of a, 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 a monomic. You're writing a paragraph. You don't know where to begin or end. You begin at the topic sentence, and it tells you how to go on. Uh, there's something called power, pick my idea, organize, write, say more. And as I said, each of these things are techniques that have been tried. They've been tried in high school with adults, with the disabilities, with all the various audiences. And you can find papers on them. As I said, there's a lot of literature on how to make people write. OK. So let's continue with the other attempts. Once you have a method like cops, power, or tree, what do you do? Uh, how do you study for it? Uh, well, there's something called SRDS, which is Self-Regulated strategy, strategy Development. And there are six stages to learning. Um, you start with the student background. And then you present the strategies. You, uh, whatever strategy you're using, cops, tree, et cetera, you model it. You ask the student to memorize it. Um, and then you go through a stage. So you've presented the strategy. You've used the person's background. You've had the person exposed to it by modeling it and memorizing it. That's, that's two of the six stages. You, the, the student then practices it. How do you practice? Well. There are lots of parts to the practice, but I'm, I'm focusing on prompts and feedback. So the student's writing, and he says, what do I do now? And you tell them, oh, this is what the method says. It says at this point, you have the topic sentence, tree, give the reasons. And they said, yeah, I forgot that. And you go on and on. Then the student writes, and you say, you know, you, you applied this. You were a little weak on this. So you have prompts and feedback. I, I found the interesting phrase, faded feedback. 
So the student does this the first time you're sort of loud and clear, as you say, you have a loud voice, and say, you forgot the reasons. I said, sorry. Uh, and the second time you said, you know, you're a little bit weak on the reasons. So your, your feedback is fading. And finally, after a while, the student learns to do the strategy by themselves. And that's called mastery. So this is a method when you're in a non-school setting, I should emphasize. So you're teaching adults, you're teaching disabled students or other things. You don't have the structure of a school where people come in every day. They have to come in. You have to grade them and all these have tos. Uh, they're taking a course for a few hours and you're training them. This is a very nice method, taking any method of study and implementing it to the student. OK. Other attempts. Um, uh, this is not in my paper, but it was such a beautiful example, I thought I'd bring it. Uh, this, if all you came from this presentation is this, I think it's wonderful. Writing good prose, a simple structural approach uh, by those two authors. And the whole book is about organization. It's a college book, but there's no grammar. It's in the appendix. So this is how the book starts. So I made up this paragraph. The Easter Conference is held in Orlando, Florida. There are 17,500 species of butterflies, all quite colorful. Prince William, Duchess Kate, and Prince George visited Taranga Zoo on April 20th, 2014. And the author says, what's wrong with this paragraph? The sentences are all well formulated. Everything is fine. The thing that's wrong with it is the sentences have nothing to do with each other. And if you look at the paragraph, it's a well-formed paragraph, but the sentences have nothing to do with each other. And the author says, this is what college writing is like. It's, they produce paragraphs like this. And, and the, the point is to get them focused on producing good paragraphs. So let me tell you a little bit about the book. The book is divided into three parts. Part one is sentence pairs. Did you know there are four types of sentences? Part two is paragraphs. Did you know there are five types of paragraphs? And part three is essays. College grammar is in an appendix. And you spend your semester learning about how two sentences, the various methods two sentences can combine, the various methods you can write a paragraph in. Everything is very structured. Everything there are exercises. I'll only go into the sentence pairs because I have other things to do. Uh, but there are child, he doesn't call it this way. He calls them child, equal, and parent. So for example, A and B can be related by consequence, result, effect, Q and A, or examples. And it, you go through each of these, and you, you practice examples, and you get very good at having one sentence and making a second sentence. Then there are equal meaning relationships, such as contrast, alternative, analogy, and parallel. You're saying something, you give an analogy, you give a contrast, etc. There are parent meaning relationships. You've stated something, what is the cause, what is the definition, what is the question, support, and generalization. And as I say, you have this for all four sentence types and all the five paragraph types. OK, let's get to my approach. I'm going to emphasize organization executive function skills. Uh, you can go to the American Society of Cybernetics, their website. Basically, cybernetics is organization of the whole, relationship between parts of a complex system independent of content. And that's what we need for writing. Uh, an essay is a complex system in a miniature level, and uh, this would help us here. I'm going to speak more about cybernetics in the plenary talk tomorrow, so I didn't think I'd speak too much about it today. For writing, I'm going to use, uh, this is called Using Tree Structures to Reflect Paragraph and Essay Organization. And it's, uh, I quoted the reference, all the references are in the paper, but writing descriptive essays using the tree diagram as a tool. As you see, it had about 12 authors. It's a recent paper. Um, it goes back to an original paper in 2003. Uh, for some reason, this is being done in Asia and China. I don't know why. Basically, the idea is to use a tree type structure. And the tree type structure mirrors the development of the paragraph. And that helps the student, once they write the tree structure, if you're over here, you write some things, you write some things here, you can write the essay down. And that really helps with um, writing. And I'll just mention this. I had to go to about five papers to find this six-level hierarchy. Why does it work? I shouldn't say well, my approach, why does it work? Why does the tree work? Well, your goal is improved writing. And how do you get that? Well, improved writing comes from more writing. We found that people who have good writing, well, they write all the time. They write to their friends. They, they're on Facebook, Twitter, and everything else. There are things that happen beyond the classroom. So they write all the time. Well, then you have the question, why do some people write all the time and some people don't? Well, the answer is self-efficacy. That's a concept due to Bandura. Basically, it says, um, uh, basically, how much confidence do I have in my writing? If I'm going to write and someone says, you know, I didn't understand that sentence. That sentence is not a grammatical. I'm going to stop writing, even if it's to my friends. So the point is, you're going to write more if you believe you can write. Then you write to your friends, you write to your parents, you write to everyone in the world, and you don't expect to get criticized. 
how do you, how do you get that self-confidence? Well, you have to remove anxiety, and there's a whole literature on anxiety. There are three major types of anxiety. There are non-starters, non-completers, and non-enders. So non-starters, I see this sometimes in my math tests when I have complicated writing. They'll just stare into space, and they're trying to think, where do I begin? And then there are people I could tell them in my office how to begin, and they can begin, and they can go through the problem. But maybe uh, they start doing things, and they just don't end. They forget to answer the question. That's the type of anxiety. You did something, and you're afraid to finish. Or there are people who go to the end and have the beginning and are sketchy on the things in the middle. So how do you remove the anxiety? You master something. What do you master? You master your knowledge of this technique. So this is, an, uh, this is a hierarchy, but explains why things work. So I knew I only had 25 minutes. I decided to give some examples. I was going to give an example from higher level mathematics. I'm going to give an example from the Psalms. And I was speaking to Claire Gill yesterday. And um, she mentioned, is she here? No, she said she'd come. Anyway, I told her I'd give her credit for this. She mentioned to Nagib that they're praying for the success of the Easter conference. So I wrote a psalm last night just to show you how you can apply this. And, uh, but the point is, it, it uses the tree method. So this is tree method. This is the 53rd psalm, in case you didn't recognize it. I'll read you the psalm, and then I'll show you. So I'm reading the psalm now, I'm not writing it, but I'll show you how the tree structure helps me understand it. So this is the psalm. I left out the introductory sentence. God, save me for your name. Justify me through your strength. God, hear my prayer. Hearken to my mouth words. God helps me. God is among those who support my feelings. For strangers have ribboned up against me and oppress or, or seek after my soul. They have not set God before them. He has saved me from every trouble. I have cast my eyes on my enemies. I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I will praise your name, God, for it is good. That is the 53rd Psalm, a very short six-sentence psalm. What I do here, using the tree method, is I start the topic sentence or the topic concept is salvation. So I'm going to spend a little time on this and then leave open for questions or maybe uh, maybe use up all my time. So one method of developing any concept is temporal. Salvation in the past, salvation in the present, salvation in the future. And I, I, I'll give you a list of techniques by which um, I, you, know, you can write psalms or write anything. Then when you have, uh, you have something salvation, I call this grammatical development, you're going to save. Save who? Well, save me. A and you start talking about me. And anytime you say something, you can have a prayer for it. And that's just verses 3 and 4. Verses 1 and 2 are just introductory verses. The present, again, is grammatical. God saves me. And again, you have the grammatical concept, save me from what? Well, from my enemies. So you have a verse describing enemies. OK? And the, the past one, God saved me, and a little prayer. So let's just look at this. So this one is, God save me for your name, just to my, me through your strength. And that's the save me thing. And then he says a prayer, God hear my prayer, hearken to my mouth's words. The connection between verse 4 and verse 3 is that verse 4 says, I'm praying for what I just said in verse 3. And as I said, this is a method of development. But if you're looking at it from a tree point of view, you can write it down and, and do everything. Now let's look at how, he, how the psalmist develops the present salvation. Since God saved me, will save me from what, my enemies. So here, it's like this verse. God helps me. God is among those who support my feelings. But then in the next verse, the development here is through grammatical. God saves me from my enemies. So he starts talking about my enemies. Strangers have risen up against me. They oppress me. They seek after my soul. They have not set God before them. Uh, this is called an enumerative sentence. You list properties of the enemies. And, um, and, and it goes through this. Anyway, so this is an example of a tree structure. I said I wrote a psalm for Easter, so we'll see how well I do. Oh, first I wanted to tell you about the um, methods of development. You can have temporal, present, future, and past. You can have grammatical. So if I say, God save me, save me from my enemies. Or, or you can say, save me. You can then say, God save me. Or save me or save my nation. You could go to the various parts of a sentence where we say who, what, when, where, and it is. Um, anything can be developed by prayer. Once you say something, you could speak about praying or offering sacrifices. Contrast and analogy. Uh, you can develop something by saying, you know, I'm saved, other people are not saved, or whatever you want. Uh, lists are a powerful method. If you're saying something, you can enumerate lists. The Faulkner book I showed you has a category of sentences called enumerative, where you develop something by listing examples. I, I use this. This is a Sinandoki. It's, it's illustrating a theory by a paradigmatic example. I don't know if I should have used that term. It's from figures of speech. But basically, you want to illustrate something, and you take a very good example. 
general and particular, and objective personal. So as I said, if I had time, I could go through a lot of psalms or a lot of literature. Uh, anyway, this is the psalm I wrote for. No one has to rise. Uh, God continue Easter. And uh, so um, how did I develop this? Uh, so I used the indirect object. God continue Easter run by Najib. So God grant wisdom to Najib to plan effectively and help Easter grow. And I wanted to give an example, so I took myself. I knew nothing about cybernetics. My paper was accepted in 2008. I was then made a referee. I was placed in the board of directors. And now I've been given uh, a chance to present a plenary session. So Easter must be good. And then contrast uh, a list. We are not like other conferences. We referee with a three-prong approach, blind referees, non-blind referees, and peer reviews. We are a multi-conference. We're multidisciplinary and multinational. And then I conclude. Over banquets, good wine, vintage wine, and stimulating camaraderie, we'll give thanks to you for continuing, <laughs> for continuing Easter. So, um, oh, you know, Tom, you're here. So I, I promised you a psalm. You can tell your mother that. Right, we just have a brief round of applause for that. <laughs> OK, let me briefly finish. OK. Uh, that, by the way, was not in the presentation, obviously. OK. I just want to show that this applies to mathematics. I originally wrote this on mathematics, but then I submitted a paper. I said, what happens if this paper is liked? So I threw in the Psalms. The cash price of a new automobile is $10,000. The purchaser is willing to finance the car at 18% convertible monthly and to make payments of $250 at the end of each month for four years. Find the down payment which will be necessary. I give this, this came from a book called Kellison. I give it to my students and it drives them crazy. But if you use the tree method, it, it works. The price equal the payments. So what are the payments? Well, there's the original price of $10,000, if you read the problem. And then there are the monthly payments. There's the de so the price of the car is $10,000. And the price has to equal the payments. What payments? There's a down payment and monthly payments. And this is what bothers students. They can plug in a formula if there's just a down payment and monthly payments. But if you put two things together, it drives them crazy. They say, what do I do with them? Well, what you do with them is you write a tree and you have two parts. So the $10,000 has to equal the down payment and the monthly payments. And the down payment is whatever it is. It's an unknown. The monthly payment's how much, when, at the end of the month, for how long, and what rate. And the point is, there's a formula if you have monthly payments and you know how much, when it is, how long, and the rate that you can get the equivalent value at time zero. So that gives you the monthly payment. Everyone can solve this. They can then relate it with the down payment, set it equal to 10,000, and solve for D. So I found this useful. I've been teaching actuarial courses. And in one of the courses where I have a lot of complex problems, I've encouraged this. And as I said, it helps remove anxiety. Students used to look like this, at least start writing things down and other things. Anyway, I have time, maybe two minutes for questions. But that basically was my presentation. And as I said, if I've convinced you of anything, I hope that uh, you'll start using trees when you write your essays and everything else. Now you can give me an applause. <laughs>